<clears throat> Good evening. Uh, I'm McCarthy Coyle, and this is a public conversation over Channel 7, Missoula Community Access Television. And it's not a night for watching television. The full moon is up there, and uh, the weather's great, and uh, nobody should be watching television tonight. Um, so, uh, and uh, good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and all the ships at sea, as Walter Winchell used to say 30 or 40 years ago. My family and I used to listen to him out in New York. And um, we got a few things to talk about tonight. We got uh, censorship in Great Falls, Montana. And we've also got another interesting thing in uh, Great Falls, um, which we'll get to. Oh, and uh, good evening, city council men and women. Stay tuned. I may have some important information for you. You might have to watch the whole hour. Uh, we may be talking about Louis L'Amour, the uh, Western fiction writer, and uh, Susan Sontag, the writer who has been in um, Bosnia, uh, in recent times and is calling Western writers' consciences to account in that situation. Irish resettlement, uh, resettlement of urban slum dwellers to the countryside of Ireland. And uh, we got homecoming this weekend. Um, and the shopping cart drill team the famous or infamous shopping cart drill team will be making its appearance in the homecoming parade once again, uh, produced and directed by Craig Mentier. I believe this is our fourth or fifth uh, participation in homecoming, <laughs> um, and uh, that should be fun. I think that's Saturday. And uh, my uh, friend Lori Hudak, who works at uh, MCAT, has suggested at times gone by, she said, well, why don't you talk about some of the things that you've uh, seen in Missoula and uh, what's going on? And I wanted to call attention to something that I did see about a month ago. Uh, friend Craig Mentier and I went to see I Stand Before You Naked, which was a play. I don't have the program, but Craig and I, uh, Craig's another uh, theater producer and director, were astonished. It was one of the most exciting pieces of theater that we have seen in Missoula in many years. And it was a selection of pieces by uh, Joyce Carol Oates. And there were nine women in the production. And each of them was sensational, astonishing. The, pr the show was riveting. And it's a shame that uh, theater pieces that, that, that originate in Missoula um, usually only get about three days uh, of performances, like in this case. But uh, I'd like to see that show brought back uh, so that more of you could see it uh, live. It was a sensational and spectacular show. Uh, the lighting, the design, the direction, the performances were, were just, just wonderful. Um, and I am... I. Uh, you know, a good friend from Montana, uh, I think the moon is pulling all of us. We seem to be in transition. Um, the world seems to be in transition. And a friend from Montana who's a folklorist and a singer and uh, a clown is thinking about going and selling dental equipment in the Carolinas. And uh, I, I wish this friend of mine all the luck in the world. <laughs> And I hope he saves a lot of money and comes back and spends it on us. Um, anyway, um, the moon is full. Uh, Susan Sontag, the writer, has been in Bosnia recently. And I want to stay tuned for this Great Falls uh, stuff, which is very interesting. Um, Susan Sontag, uh, the writer, novelist, essayist. Uh, she's 60 years old. She, she left her home in New York City to go to Bosnia uh, to direct and produce a production of Waiting for Godot. Um, 
And this play involved Croatians and Muslims and Croats. And, uh, you know, she was in danger of her life, of course, while she was there. It's pretty scary to be in Bosnia these days. And Sontag uh, remained, and let me quote from her, from uh, Susan Sontag. She says she will probably be back in Bosnia later this fall, probably to direct in another play. And in, and in an interview, she called other writers and artists and performers to what she described as a, quote, moral duty. Sarajevo is the Spanish Civil War of our time, but the difference in response is amazing, she said. In 1937, people like Ernest Hemingway and Andre Malraux and George Orwell and Simone Weil rushed to Spain, although it was incredibly dangerous. Simone Weil got terrible burns and George Orwell got shot. But they didn't see the danger. They didn't see the danger as a reason not to go. They went as an act of solidarity. And from that act grew some of the finest literature of their time. And after her first trip to Bosnia, Ms. Sontag said she talked with other well-known writers and producers in Europe and the United States who expressed surprise that she had been willing to risk her life. But I don't think, Sontag said, the fact that Sarajevo is dangerous is really the reason. I think there is an underlying reason that is deeper and more disturbing. And it is the difference between 1937 and 1993. I think, Sontag said, there has been a failure of conscience on the, part, on the part of writers and intellectuals in the Western world. As Sontag spoke, a huge blast shook the neighborhood near the theater, another shell from the Serbian guns. A quarter of a century ago in 1968, and again in 1972, Sontag traveled to North Vietnam along with other American intell intellectuals opposed to the United States' role in the war there. And she gained a reputation as a pacifist, as a pacifist. But in this, too, she has marked her distance from some of her old companions in the anti-war movement. In Sarajevo, she has made no secret of her support for American military intervention against the Serbs. It's not Godot I am waiting for, Sontag said. Like most of the people in Sarajevo, I am waiting for Clinton. I was in the, uh, I was in the uh, United States Coast Guard uh, a long time ago, when I was just a young kid, still in my teens. And I liked the job I had. I was a radio operator, Morse code radio operator. It kind of goes like this, da-da, da 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 This is the alphabet, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Dog, Echo, Foxtrot, Golf, Hotel, India, Juliet, Kilo, Mike, November, Oscar, Papa, Quebec, Romeo, Sierra, Tango, Uniform, Victory, Whiskey, X-Ray, Yankee, Zulu. And the code goes like this with your little handset. Da 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 it da 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 it da da it da 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 it da da it da da it da da it da 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 it da 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 it da 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 it da 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 it da 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 from the uh, 6th of August of this year. In the end, the Coast Guard's Morse code emergency distress system went out not with a bang, but with a dash. Now closing down continuous watch began the last 
Morse code message broadcast by the Morse broadcast by the Coast Guard on Saturday. Fair winds and following seas with 73s. That's radio talk lingo for best wishes. 73s from all of us. And with these words transmitted in the Morse codes familiar dots and dashes, the Coast Guard shut down its Morse code service. So I kind of feel sentimental about that. Um, it was a good job, and um, uh, it was fun, and I still miss it. I still like to send code. I still like to take code. 70 words a minute. Yeah, I think I was pretty good. Um, anyway, let's see. Uh, listen, I want to say uh, also a thank you to uh, Bob Lucino, uh, former city councilman in Missoula. And uh, Mr. Lucino uh, traveled to Ireland uh, this year, to the, north, uh, to the north of Ireland, to the six counties uh, controlled by Great Britain. And he was there, as I understand it, on an interfaith mission, um, trying to understand some of the difficulties there and the violence uh, and the killings and I just want to take uh, my invisible hat off to Bob Lucino and others like him who go all the way from a small town in Montana across the world and across the Atlantic Ocean uh, to see what they can do as individual citizens to bring some, some peace and, and calm to an unsettled and violent land. The killings go on. I mean, we read about Bosnia, and we read about uh, uh, Mogadishu, and uh, we forget that uh, every week I was reading the Irish Times newspaper today, an earlier edition from this month, and the slaughter of women and men and children continues. The violence continues in the north. Uh, the IRA gets a lot of uh, uh, accusations, but indeed it's the Protestant paramilitary organizations which are now contributing the greatest amount of violence uh, to that situation. So thank you, Bob, and uh, your colleagues and others who are, are, are traveling there. Um, and I also came across uh, an interesting thing which I think has some applications uh, for the United States. In Ireland, uh, in Dublin, for example, which uh, contains about 33 percent of the Irish population, uh, the Irish population is only about three million in some, and Dublin contains a million. Uh, there is a terrible unemployment problem. I think it's officially at least 20 percent the worst in the European community. And uh, so like in the United States, uh, uh, the Irish government has constructed a lot of public housing, which is really kind of ghetto housing on the outskirts of Dublin, you know, miles outside of the city center. People are on the dole, what we call welfare here in this country. They have children that they're trying to bring up. And meanwhile, in the, west of, uh, in the west of Ireland, Dublin is on, uh, someone can call me if they want to correct my geography, but Dublin is on the Irish Sea facing across towards Great Britain. But to the west of Ireland, on the Atlantic Ocean, uh, that's all rural, rural territory, and a lot of villages there are dying because the people are leaving and the people have left. There's abandoned housing and ab cottages and abandoned farms and schools are closing because uh, the Irish government, just like in the United States, if you get down to where there are only two or three children in the school, then the government closes the school. There's not enough students there to, to uh, make it uh, economically feasible. So in Ireland, what they're doing is kind of an, uh, an outward, a rural migration. And um, so people who are living in this public housing projects, these dismal public housing projects in Dublin, are being invited and encouraged to move to the west of Ireland to build up these communities 
They're already on the dole in Dublin, and there's no way out because there are no jobs. There are no jobs. So there's really no increase in welfare costs for these people to be resettled in a calm place in the west of Ireland to rejuvenate those communities there, to, 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 to have their children safe from violence, to get away from the drug problems in Dublin. Yes, Ireland has drug problems just like we do. Um, and there are now 2,000 families that have been resettled in, 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 in good housing in, in the west of Ireland. And um, it's something that uh, years ago I wondered about for Montana. Um, w why is it that we couldn't think about ways to resettle some of our own American uh, brethren um, from the inner cities uh, all across the country? Those who, are w those who are willing, I mean, this is a voluntary thing. You have to apply for it. Um, and uh, be resettled. I mean, what, what's the difference between receiving uh, welfare in New York uh, and being on Social Security uh, payments in, in Los Angeles and, uh, and being on the same setup here in, for example, um, the rural parts of Montana, which, like the rural parts of Ireland, uh, some of our villages are are also fading away because uh, there's no one left there, just a few families. But there's housing there, and there's schools that need pupils. Uh, Paul Goodman, um, who is a, uh, a, a writer now dead, a uh, sociologist and a writer, Paul Goodman. Um, he's a hero of uh, uh, Richie Doyle's, uh, an MCAT producer. and. Um, uh, he's, uh, Richie Doyle is also on the Speaker's Bureau for the Montana Committee for the Humanities, doing uh, a great gig of the uh, Montana cowboy Teddy Blue. Uh, but Richie uh, has kind of uh, rejuvenated my interest in the writings of Paul Goodman. And Paul Goodman, you know, 30, 40 years ago was writing about what our opportunities to resettle urban youth in rural atmospheres. Give them another shot. Give them a leg up. So that's an interesting uh, proposition. Let's go up to Great Falls. Now, this is, a, this is not that difficult. It's just a newspaper, so no one should be frightened. Um, we got a big censorship on the front page of the Great Falls Tribune. And um, we, uh, we, have a, we have a robotic crew tonight, so... Uh, yeah, you won't be able, let me see, how's that, well, I can just about see that there. Anyway, it's the front page article, art show, art show, just not appropriate, okay? Now, this was a show put on, there's two parts to this, because we're going to go on to the sports pages of the Great Falls Tribune. So, s bear with us here. There's an interesting connection between um, the school superintendent who is also a member, uh, I think he has been in the past, if not now in the present, uh, he's a member of the Montana Arts Council, Larry Williams, who's the uh, school superintendent in Great Falls. Okay, so the Paris Gibson Museum put on a show, um, and it was designed for school children as well as more uh, older people, and every year, Groups of school children come go down to the Paris Gibson Museum to see the show and learn something. And the school, the schools of Great Falls decided that this show was not appropriate for third graders. Okay, okay. Now let's go into some of the nitty gritty. Um, the school district's decision to cancel third graders' tours of an art show at Paris Gibson Square was criticized Wednesday. Please bear with me. We're going to the sports pages for the connection. This is the Rush Limbaugh routine, okay? Stay tuned for the sports pages. Was criticized Wednesday as censorship by the museum curator, but defended as a proper judgment call by school administrators. 
museum curator Barbara Racker, who organized the exhibit, said she was shocked and dismayed that six principals are making the decision for parents and teachers. Somebody may not agree with the Native American or Mexican artistic and cultural viewpoint, but they shouldn't prevent others from seeing, Racker said. She's the curator, Racker. Stressing she was speaking for herself and not the museum. And she was speaking for herself because her board of directors asked her not to go public with her complaints. School superintendent Larry Williams denied there was any censorship involved. The current exhibit, Williams said, remains intact and its validity has not been questioned or tampered with by the school district, Williams said. We believe the museum's exhibits are of very high quality, but we decided this one was just not appropriate for third graders on a field trip. Uh, the museum's interim director said the board had asked the curator, Racker, not to go public, not to go public, and to instead work out issues privately, privately with school officials. Okay, let's switch to the continuation of the jump page here. But the curator, Racker, said she felt compelled to raise the issue to prevent more, to prevent more censorship. She said a scheduled tour of the museum's annual show last month by the middle school students was canceled after art teachers and an administrator objected to the political content of one picture and nudity in another. I'm afraid, she said, that this will go further and further and school officials will object, object to some aspect of every show noting that the next two ex exhibitions also will contain limited nudity. Okay. Okay. Under the four-year-old program, all third graders tour the Mar Modern Art Museum at Paris Gibson Square sometime in the school year. Okay. Now let's get to the content because I'm sure this is what you've been waiting to, 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 to find out a little bit about. Okay. What's the content of here? Okay. Here, an Indian, ex Indian artist called The Rebirth of a Culture exhibit four Native American artists, including one work that illustrate the Indian view that the statues on Mount Rushmore are a desecration. Okay? What is that desecration in this exhibit that the third graders were not allowed to see? Okay, the artist was Corky Claremont. The, her project was called Paha Sapa, and it shows silhouettes of an Indian and a white family viewing Mount Rushmore. Reflected in their sunglasses, the white family sees the carved statues of early presidents, but the Indian family which views the carvings as a desecration of the sacred black hills, sees them as skulls. This is very dangerous, my friends. This is certainly not appropriate for third graders. I mean, third graders, what have they seen? They only watch American television. They only watch violence on television but they're not going to be allowed to see this exhibit by four Indian artists. This is, this is a disgrace. Hold on, we're going to get to the sports pages. I'm holding calls till I get done here. Thank you. Um, school officials say, okay, one other, okay. Then here's a painting that was also something that they didn't want the third graders to see. Now, I saw this painting at the Missoula, Missoula Museum of the Artist, Arts done by the Indian artist Ernest Pepion. He, he's a handicapped, uh, he had an accident, he's in a wheelchair. It was a very exciting exhibit I saw at the Missoula Museum of the Arts. And, um, and, 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 and so I saw the painting that they're also concerned with. So this is a self-portrait that Pepion did. Bear in mind that he works from a wheelchair. He's always in a wheelchair. And the painting shows him 
rising from his wheelchair and walking away from factory pollution, walking away from factory pollution toward a fully nude woman standing by a white horse. The curator said the nude is meant to symbolize beauty, purity, and Mother Earth. I saw the painting. The nude woman is just that. She's a beautiful symbol of purity and the earth. And this is what they don't want third graders to see, the same third graders who see all the crud on American commercial television. So, uh, and then there was one other exhibit that disturbed them using doll parts. One wall was comprised of dozens of unclad armlet. And uh, caller, if you could hold on, I just want to finish up this, uh, complete this circle here. So in the third exhibit, one wall is comprised of dozens of unclad armless dolls. Dolls. Another shows dolls on a shelf above a pink corset. A fishbowl contains several doll parts and live goldfish. I think if I was a third grader, I might not understand it all, but I certainly would get a kick out of seeing live goldfish in a bowl with parts of dolls. School officials said the symbolism of this room's exhibit may have been the most difficult for third graders. Well, I don't know whether I'm expected to understand symbolism as a third grader. I'm just supposed to look and understand or reject or like or not like, okay? Um, so that's the exhibit. Okay, that's the, art, that's the art museum, and that's the school superintendent, Larry Williams. Okay, let's go to the sports pages. The election of it, this is the, the same newspaper, this is today's Great Falls Tribune. The election of an admitted felon to homecoming king of Great Falls High School last weekend is forcing school officials to look at their policies, but they don't expect to make any immediate changes. Of course they don't. Um, the reaction has been, this is a quote, the reaction has been pretty much across the spectrum of the school's need to do nothing to the school's need to take action, Superintendent Larry Williams said of the calls he received on Wednesday. The callers were responding to news that James Tribble, a football player described by school officials as an ideal student, had pleaded, had pleaded true this summer in juvenile court to sexually molesting a three-year-old girl in 1992. A true plea in juvenile court is similar to a guilty plea in adult court. I need more information before I decide what we need to do, said the chairwoman of the Great Falls School Board, Mary Dunn. Okay, I think that's enough to make the comparison. So the Great Falls School District, Larry Williams, the superintendent, is canceling a tour by third graders of an exhibit of art at the museum, but they don't know what to do about uh, an acknowledged molester of a Great Falls High School student who is an ideal student who said true to the charges that he had molested a three-year-old girl. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Hello, you're on the air. Yeah, hey, Matt. Oh, Hello. God, I guess I have to leave the room. Um, when you're talking about censorship in Great Falls, I thought I'd bring it back to our own little community. Uh, you saw the paper yesterday where the council is considering cutting public comment because they're tired of tirades, they're tired of being harassed and abused. Uh, uh, I did not see that uh, that story, but I've, I've picked up, I've, I've heard rumors of that. You're talking about the, uh, the time in the city council meeting when anyone in the public is allowed to come up and speak for as long as three minutes uh, on any matter that is of concern to them. Right, the beginning of the meeting, which, yeah. <coughs> which I've always thought was know, an incredible homage to how we do business in Missoula. Right. And now... Um, well, what did the story say? What, what's going well, on? I've got it right here in front of me. Yeah. I don't want to read the whole thing, but um, uh, I'm trying to find new... 
questions, comments here. He says, uh, You mean the city attorney? It is clear council members don't have to put up with abusiveness, Nugent said. You have to take into account public officials' rights not to be harangued and harassed, making it so nobody wants to run. No one has, this is my favorite, no one has an absolute right to free speech, and you're entitled to make reasonable rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. let's see. The council has already made a rule that says members of the quote members of the public shall not be allowed to make negative personal comments, personal criticisms, or personal attacks on any city council member, city elected official, or a city staff member during comments made at any city council meeting. So when are you supposed to make those kind of comments? Well, apparently you don't get a chance to do that at all. I see. I mean, I'm I'm just I'm I'm mortified. I'm very very sad and depressed and really horrified that. Um, you know, our city council in Missoula, Montana, could possibly be considering cutting public comment. Well, it's 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 it's. Uh, let me just uh, let me jump to the end. I I don't know why. Uh, you know, there's never a dialogue, right? There's never a, what's called a formally a colloquy between the public and elected officials or staff in public. Why is it that at the end of city council meetings that the council doesn't, you know, maybe take a five-minute rest break and then be available for a, 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 a televised dialogue or conversation so that they can respond to questions from the public uh, uh, I I instead of this tit-for-tat business? Well, uh, that would be a very civilized way of doing it. It would certainly give everybody a chance to enter into a dialogue as opposed to this is what I think. The, the, uh, I mean, the thing of it is, is that when you run for office, um, and, and I, myself, for example, uh, hey, I, I'm in public life. I mean, I'm not an elected official, but I'm in public life. I take a lot of flack. I get calls from angry people who here on this show don't like me, and I, I listen. Um, sometimes I hurt. And uh, so, I mean, they're elected officials. One of the things that the, that the Supreme, United States Supreme Court decided many years ago is that, um, you know, when you're a public official, I'm sorry, but you have to put up with it. It goes with the territory. I agree. I totally agree. Apparently, what's really uh, made our council angry, or some of our council members angry, is that um, Ross Bass has been standing up many weeks in a row, I think, oh, maybe five or six, and he's been trying to point out that, as far as he understands by the Montana state constitution, that Bob Hermas has a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Bob Hermas, as you know, works for uh, KPAX, mm -hmm. the sells ads down there, and he's on the t cable TV committee. And for many months, um, Best. Ross Best has been trying to point out this mm -hmm. is a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Well, um, apparently that's that's what has um, these people so angry. But you know, I mean, I Fred Rice took some real abuse, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. real abuse years ago, and and um, they did do. Uh, they went to Fred. Uh, the let's see, Patricia Sullivan wrote this article for the Missoulian in yesterday's paper. Mm -hmm. They did go to Fred, and, and they said, um, well, I'll read this to you. Rice, who was not at the committee meeting, said in an interview later that I'm he sorry, remembered Ray, the attack. I'm uh, sorry, Ray. Could you start again, I'm sorry, and go a little bit slower? Rice, Fred Rice, mm -hmm. who was not at the committee meeting, said in an interview later that he remembered the attacks, the personal attacks that he took for mm -hmm. weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. But he had nothing uh, to do with instituting the current rule, mm -hmm. quote, I'm a knee-jerk civil libertarian, said Rice, now city's personnel and equal uh, employment opportunity officer, quote, I don't like everything that people say, but I think that they have the right to say it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, I think, you know, this is someone who really, really could, uh, as, a, as a personal... Um, you know, just personally go, yes, I agree. Let's mm -hmm. cut off these rights to say mm -hmm. what anybody's thinking at the beginning of the meeting. Let's mm -hmm. just stop this right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, uh, Ray, thanks for calling and, 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 and mentioning I mean, I, I, the fact that Bob Hermes resigned from the cable television subcommittee uh, the other night, uh, although uh, apparently, as I understand it, Mr. Hermes said uh, 
He did not resign uh, because of any suggestion that he was in conflict of interest. Um, but I think that uh, Ross Best's appearances before the council, um, uh, and I don't, I didn't, while they were, certainly if I was the recipient of those comments, I would not be comfortable. Um, but uh, they were to the point. They were raising an issue. I mean, Best uh, uh, was, uh, you know. Yes, and he was never rude, and he never took up. He, he was always consider came in considerably less than his three minutes, and um, he was speaking constitutional law, and, um, you know. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that one of the things that's uh, occurred to me in the past uh, couple months if we wa as, as we watch some of this cable television business unfold is a, a, a term uh, that is not very, uh, you know, not everybody knows it, but we, people have heard of malfeasance in office. But I wonder about misfeasance, a uh, legal term which talks about how elected officials can follow a legal course to achieve an illegal goal. Uh, I wonder if we very don't. Very interesting, McCarthy. That is very interesting. I don't know if we. Uh, I don't know if we d don't need an investigation of the whole process. I mean, even these subcommittee meetings. I, I. I think that the whole council needs to look at a reform. A reform of how it does its work, and and in especially in the subcommittee process, because you have uh, people come into subcommittee meetings, council people, who stay for a limited amount of time to vote on the issue that they're concerned about don't stay to hear other citizens' testimony um, on other matters, don't stay in the meeting to vote and participate in discussions on other matters, but just stay long enough to put the kibosh on what they want to put the kibosh on. So I think it's time for some reform. And Ray, uh, I think we got another call waiting. Okay, well, my theory is that if you can't stand the heat, then don't um, run in an election and try to get in the kitchen. All right. Bye. Thank you. Uh, you're on the air. Hi, McCarthy. How are you doing? All right. <laughs> I wanted to kind of throw something at you. Did you look... Not, not, I hope it's not too bad. No, this is not bad. I just thought I want to bring you and make you a wise owl. Tonight. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. I'm going to make you a wise owl. The videotape of MCAT when it was before the city council, did you observe that video very closely? Uh, I did not. Well, I think you should go back and observe that for just for your records and uh, for MCAT's records and see who stacked those meetings on the neg uh, negative side. Hmm. And then uh, remember, next time you go out to buy a wimpy truck, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Hey, thanks a lot for the, for the reminder. Well, I just thought I, uh, well, I sat there and listened and watched that tape tonight, and uh, it, it, something just didn't touch right in the craw, and I... And then I caught on to exactly what was going on. So I think the reason why Hermes kind of dis, uh, discontinued that, because there's more to the story that meets the eyes. And if I think you go back over that videotape, I think you're going to find a few people stack that meeting from a certain TV station. So without that, have a good evening. Bye. Hey, thanks for calling. You bet. All right. Um, I'll pick up line one in a minute here. Um, I just wanted to say that, uh, Mr. Hermes has uh, left the uh, cable television subcommittee meeting, but I don't know whether he's going to be voting, for example, uh, I don't know whether he intends to be voting on rate regulation, um, that is to say cable television subscribers, you consumers who are paying the franchise fee, and whether you want any rollbacks in the fees. Um, uh, his, uh, Mr. Hermes station, as, uh, you know, broadcast stations in Missoula uh, have been in a, you know, ongoing dispute with the cable industry about uh, whether the cable company will carry their station. So, I don't know, that puts, uh, I, would th I would think that that puts uh, uh, council members who are working for those stations in a rather peculiar position in terms of whether they're going to, whether they vote yes to rate regulation or whether they vote no to it. Uh, one of the city officials uh, pointed out to me recently that, for example, Doug Harrison, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, viewers, um, I guess who's associated as a worker with the Mountain Water Company, but the city official pointed out to me that Mr. Harrison always excuses his, himself from votes 
that come anywhere near issues to do with the water company. And it was suggested by this city official that, uh, that uh, Mr. Hermes might follow the same course. Uh, hello, you're on the air. Well, first I'd like to thank you for all your hard work you're doing. Thank you. And uh, I was wondering, um, what, uh, what portion of the taxpayer dollar is uh, actually supporting, or the Missoula taxpayer dollar supporting the uh, MCAT? Uh, there, are, there, are no, there are no tax dollars supporting Missoula Community Access Television. No tax dollars. Um, if you're a subscriber to cable television, there is a franchise fee that is collected, as you probably know if you're a subscriber, and that goes to the city. Um, that franchise fee is 5% of the cable company's gross revenues in Missoula. Um, so it is, it, it is just cable subscribers, not all taxpayers, who pay that fee. Now, uh, to, to be more specific in response to your question, uh, the last figures that I hear is that the city collects, the 5% amounts to, on a yearly basis now, somewhere around $180,000. And up until recently, or up to the present time, Missoula Community Access Television has been receiving um, about 100000 of the 180000 Oh, and, and tell me one more quick thing. Yeah. Uh, when you when you speak of reform in the in the cable TV business, tell me exactly what uh, what your uh, goals are with that reform, or tell me your methods as to how you're going to attain those goals. Um, well, I'm, you know, I, I I think my function a lot of the time is to ask questions. I don't have all the answers, uh, um, and. So I guess I wasn't speaking so much. I most I have been most directly concerned with the business of the cable television subcommittee. But I wonder I wonder if the problems that we see there in those subcommittee meetings are not echoed to one degree or another at other city council subcommittee meetings. That is to say, the ability to participate uh, on the part of citizens. Uh, you know, good public notice. Um, um, uh, a okay, you asked specifically. I do have some specifics. That every city council member should report any uh, what are called, as I understand the law, ex parte, e x p a r t e, ex parte conversations with interested parties. Uh, that is to say, if the cable company calls up a city council person and says, look, can you help me out on this, or, or uh, this is what I want to accomplish. I think that maybe we should start, uh, city council people should start reporting um, not their ordinary conversations with citizens that call up and say, well, I'm concerned about this and concerned about that, but when a, a, a company or a corporation calls up and says, this is the way I think you should do it, right? right. Um, that's an ex parte conversation. Jim Nugent or other lawyers can correct me, and I'm sure that they, they will. Right. Um, but at least that's the general idea. What, what is going on out there that we don't know about? I always want more information. Right. Uh, the other thing that I think would be uh, helpful in subcommittee meetings is that um, you know, Missoulians are pretty avid uh, viewers of C-SPAN. Yeah. Why don't we have a Missoula span? Why doesn't the city take the money that it is collecting from you subscribers and buy the equipment needed and station it permanently in subcommittee meeting rooms so that they flip a switch and it goes on to the channel so that all of Missoula can watch the, the, the business of the city? Right, right. So that would be a, a, a possible reform. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. Hello, you're on the air. McCarthy, good evening. Thank As you. always, uh, intriguing and uh, compelling conversation. Thank you. I had a rhetorical question that doesn't necessarily obviously require a direct answer, mm -hmm. but it may uh, propel the discussion forward some. Uh, you uh, made a, a rather interesting point a few minutes ago about the issue of um, limiting public comment at, uh, at, silly, at city chamber, silly chamber meetings, city chamber meetings, slip of the tongue. Freudian slip. Maybe not, maybe so. Uh, but you made a point about uh, the issue of limiting a public comment. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm wondering is, if that were to be the case, what? Where would the somewhat, uh, from at least from my standpoint, uh, being from a larger city and so forth, and seeing small town politics, from a, where would the somewhat inept 
mm -hmm, mm -hmm. fresh blood, so right. to speak. Right. Uh, well, I, I don't think I have anything really startling to respond to other than um, I, certainly, uh, you know, the public comment period I find, I find valuable, and I certainly have used it uh, uh, on a number of occasions. But I do, I do, miss, the, I do miss the opportunity to have, um, and I realize that people can't go on all night. I mean, oh, these, certainly not. these people, these city council people, I mean, I've said before that they've got an enormous job, they're underpaid, they're overworked, mm -hmm. and um, so, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't want blood out of a stone. Absolutely but not. but, but, but I, that's why I mentioned to an earlier caller, I wonder if there isn't some, in addition to the public comment period, because the way it's structured now, you get the public comment period, then later on in the meeting when it's the turn of the council members to comment, they can effectively say, well, what, uh, you know, Joe Blow had to say earlier was wrong, and, I d and, and uh, here's why it's wrong. And that's kind of like the final word. So, so we don't have, we, we, we don't have a, a, a dialogue going. Um, so, no meeting of the minds, well, you know? I mean, it, we, we don't even have the chance to have a meeting of the minds, and and so that's why I suggested. Well, I wonder if there couldn't be at least, let's say, a half an hour set aside, e either not necessarily on city council night, but on another night in which right. the city council gets together for a dialogue with the citizens, and and they respond to questions from us and from the press. If the national, po if national politicians can do it, and and. And yes. all manner of, yes. you know, superfluous, su superficial publicity about over right. it, why can't local politicians do the same thing? Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, one of the things that, that came up in this whole cable TV stuff is that the city or some city council people uh, say, well, we're not, getting an, we're not getting the service that we expected from MCAT, right? In what? Uh, and so, but, but I had city council uh, candidates and, and, and sitting people, uh, people sitting on the council who came into some recent uh, candidate shows, uh, some of whom had never been here before in four years. I mean, why didn't they um, do something with the fire department or the police department or public health and safety? I mean, the equipment is all here. It's for everybody. They could walk in just like I do. I, this is not some special privilege that I have. Right. I, 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 so, so they're not even taking advantage of the facility as it is, even as they complain about it. Right. So why aren't they down here saying, this is the work that I do. This is the problems that I have. Let me explain to you why I voted this way. Or this is, can you call me, can, uh, you know, why can't they be on the air taking call questions from callers? It's quite possible that uh, there may be many factors in uh, that. The, the situation the way it is, and it's one of them, uh, a couple of them might be, one, uh, they're inexperienced at doing such things, which is really not an explanation or, or, a, or a reason, uh, um, and it's also possible, too, that, that they could, some of them may very well be afraid to do it, that is, for fear, the fear of, of, of um, what exactly uh, they may c uh, come up against if they were just to do as you suggest, Come, come down to MCAT Studios, sit down for an evening of a conversation, and they may be afraid of what may come out of the public, of the, out from the, the out in, from, from public uh, conversations. Well, I, you know, I mean, I think that Missoula is not unlike the nation and not unlike the world. Absolutely. And, and what, the, and, and what the, they don't seem to be, some of them don't seem to be picking up on the fact is that we're a large part of the community, whether it's Missoula or the state or the nation, is extraordinarily dissatisfied dissatisfied with the action of the legislature. Absolutely. Whether it's the federal legislature or the state legislature or the city legislature, and they're not responding to that. Now, let me back up one and say that I think it's important that viewers know that I was very—I uh, don't know that I was surprised, but I was—I was interested to hear it. Because I had, I think, three candidate shows on MCAT uh, right, be, uh, before the primary. Yeah. And it, I don't know how many saw all of those, but most of the people, not all of them, but most of them, Republicans, Democrats, incumbents or challengers, libertarians, but the, the vast majority, not everyone, but the vast majority said it is time to reorganize city government.
They had different ideas. Some of them were talking about city-county consolidation. Others were talking about that, uh, you know, kind of uh, city-county departmental consolidation. Right. But the vast majority said it is time for some changes. I'm wondering, well, you, know, you know, it's all well and good for them to say that, but uh, let's hear about it. What are the changes? What, that's, what, that's what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I fully agree with you that the, that the uh, there's, you know, uh, they should allot some time or, you know, because I know that MCAT's time is uh, free mm -hmm. in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, they, should, they uh, should get together. If they really have a concern, mm -hmm. if they really do want to do what they're saying, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just saying it just to sound good, mm -hmm. you know, the sound bite on the evening news mm -hmm. trip, you know, is is Pete, politicians fall into it all the time, mm -hmm. you know? Well, I mean, I, it's, it's uh, uh, two quick things. Uh, we've got about eight minutes left, I believe. But, um, you know, this, this station, this Channel 7, provided more election campaign coverage than any other media outlet in Missoula I'm, this year. I'm absolutely convinced of and, that. And, and I think that, uh, and I said this at City Council the other night, I raised it as a question, that perhaps this is disturbing to them, that, that in fact, that this is a community that is interested enough in the process to do the coverage as volunteers. There's probably been, a, you know, a, w when they wonder, when they talk about money and they complain about money, money for MCAT, and we'd rather have it for whatever. But uh, somebody should do a calculation here at MCAT, and I would venture to say that there's probably been in the last three years probably a million dollars worth of, prof you know, of a mix of professional and volunteer time that has been invested by people. I wouldn't so, doubt it. So it's not a question of $100,000 a year. That's been matched by $900,000 worth of work uh, done by people here in the community. So uh, I think it is time that they, they, they got on the stick and started using the facility instead of complaining about it. And step up to the, you know, step up to the plate and let's make a, have a good showing, you know. If they screw up, that's, that's okay. That's human nature. Everybody makes mistakes. But at least let's step up to the plate and do something, you know. Get, you know. Uh, I just, uh, out of sync here a little bit, but the very uh, cable TV business, the very fact that they are even considering the council spending $7,000 of, of fees collected from you, right. the cable franchise fee, to pay the Rattlesnake Cable Company's insurance bill is absolutely out of the question. It's absolutely and, absurd. And, and um, uh, uh, anyway, the, anyway, um, well. Uh, I think I may have gotten the, uh, propelled the uh, conversation forward. So well, I, 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 have a good evening and thank you hey, very thank, much. Hey, thanks, thanks for calling. Bye bye. Um, well, we got a few minutes left. Um, my, um, let's see here, what have I got? How many minutes do I have left, please? Five minutes. Okay. Um, my excuse me for uh, leaping through some of my own work here, but I was thinking about my my uh, younger sister, Adrian who uh, this Sunday, October the 3rd, uh, would have been, um, and would, it would have been a joy to me and to the earth, um, as uh, probably most of you know in your own family circumstances, if she had lived to celebrate her 46th birthday this Sunday. Um, and she died of breast cancer at uh, the age of 33, and I'm really, uh, Delighted is too weak a word that uh, women, uh, primarily women across the country, are adapting the political tactics of ACT UP and raising hell uh, about the scourge of breast cancer um, that uh, attacks women, our sisters, our mothers, our daughters. And um, I was uh, looking through um, some work that I had written about um, I was about my sister in a play that uh, that I was fortunate enough to uh, have written 
and it was her life uh, that inspired me. And um, I don't know, let's see here. She talks about, um, this play is called Drawing Down the Moon, and uh, we did it in Missoula a couple of years ago at the Crystal Theater. I was privileged to have a good cast who volunteered their time. Um, um, there's a uh, there's a scene between um, the character uh, that I invented at, uh, on behalf of my sister called A.D. and her mother, whose name is Maria, and her doctor. It's set in Montana, and A.D. is uh, living in Montana, and her doctor is there, and her mother is there, who is visiting from the East Coast. And the mother says, but what are, are her options, doctor? And the sister, A.D., says to the doctor, no, doctor, you want me to absolve you. Okay, it's not your responsibility. I'm not getting much better. But I hate the way you always stand in your office. A.D., we've got three options here. Well, I'm opting to stop the chemicals for a better woman tomorrow. I don't want anybody tooling around with my body anymore. I'm used up. I'm tired. The doctor says, hey, we were friends before I was ever your physician. A.D. replies, we were acquaintances. Your wife was on a tourist trip through the feminist community. And when you showed up at some anti-nuke meetings, we all pretended that most human beings are pretty swell, no matter what. The doctor says, what am I supposed to do? Drop everything and become a revolutionary vegetarian? Contact Steve, Steve Peters for Rolfing, Laetrile, and tarot readings? We'll attend all demonstrations against injustice? Well, A.D., you expect more than most folks who walk in my office. I'm not the miracle worker you were looking for, and you ought to get over the idea you're the only person who's ever going to die. And she replies, no, not the only one, but the only me. The doctor says, and I admire your spunk. I wish I could make you strong. And she says, no, you're smug because I ate because I eat herbs and flowers and do sweat lodges, dance in circles on the, on the mountain, chant at the moon. The doctor says, it may be as good as anything I can do, but I only want to give you some relief. A few more months, you said you needed a little more time. Well, we're running out of time, and I'm running out of emotional uh, steam here. And uh, I'm sorry if that's uh, not completing the circle. But um, anyway, it's been a good evening, and uh, uh, so that's th that. I really wanted to say uh, happy birthday uh, to my sister, um, and I believe that she's up in the stars there, uh, and I think we're all riding the stars, and um, sometimes it's a tough ride, and fast, and furious, and hot, and cold, and. Uh, but it's worth the ride. It was worth the ride for my sister, and it's worth the ride for all of us. And um, I appreciate uh, you for uh, watching and listening, and, um, and I appreciate all the people who helped make uh, life in Missoula so sweet. And, um, and thanks, everybody. And bring up the music, and I'm going to say good night. Thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.